Hello everyone, welcome to my new video series. This is the Strategy Professor and we'll be playing Total War Warhammer. Um, I say we because I will be reading the comments and taking any suggestions that y'all have um, to help improve my own gameplay or just to make the campaign a little bit more spicy and interesting. So if you have some good ideas, just be sure to share them in the comments and I'll take those into consideration. Um, this is my first video series um, that I will have shot, so if you have any suggestions about pacing, timing, or other kind of content that you want to see, be sure to leave those in the comments as well. Um, so we will be playing on Legendary for this campaign. Uh, I will only be using one mod, and that is the um, Diplomatic Options and Conquer Anywhere mod. It comes as a package deal. And what that allows you to do is conquer any territory on the map, not just specific uh, territories that correspond with specific factions. So for instance, as the dwarves, we would usually only be able to conquer, I believe, the dwarven and greenskin territories. But I want to be able to conquer the world, so I want to try to take over the whole map if I can. I think that's part of the fun of Warhammer, um, and a lot of Total War games is just having that sense of massive conquest. And so I like to just enable conquering everywhere. Um, this also lets the AI do this as well, so I don't think it um, imbalances the game at all, because now you can get a super powerful AI, like if the Empire starts confederating and conquers the entire left side of the map for instance, um, then that can be really difficult to deal with. So I think it's fair on all sides. The diplomatic options just comes as part of the mod package that I got. It really doesn't change uh, the dwarves at all. It just basically allows each faction to confederate. Um, and I'll explain confederation when we get into the game a little bit more, but it basically allows you to uh, take over another race without actually having to um, fight them and there's lots of penalties and advantages um, that go along with that. We'll get that into that end of the game as well. But the dwarves naturally had this ability to confederate with other dwarves in the base game so that doesn't change anything. Um, in fact it might actually uh, make the campaign a little bit harder because now all enemies can confederate regardless of their faction. So you could have vampires confederating with other vampires for example. Um, so it might actually make the game a bit harder but I like both of those options. Um, okay, well, let's go ahead and just get right into it here. Uh, we'll do a new campaign. Now, I will say that I already have a 90-turn legendary campaign with the Greenskins, and I already also have another 55-turn legendary campaign with the Dwarves. So I have practiced this a little bit. Um, I think I've got a couple of interesting strategies to bring to the table, um, and hopefully y'all um, enjoy the content. So. As the dwarves, it's always important to think from a strategic standpoint um, how you're going to win. And that's the same for any race, right? You want to think, what are your victory conditions? How do you want to fight the fight? And then try to dictate the terms of your fight to the enemies that you'll be fighting. You always want to fight on your terms. You want to fight to your strengths. You want to play your game. So it tells you a little bit here um, about what the dwarves are good at, uh, what they're not good at. So they obviously have no magic. They have no cavalry. Um, in exchange, though, they have magic resistance, so they'll get 25% base magic resistance, so that helps you out against other enemy mages. And there are some skills and some characters in the game that allow you to um, negate their magical advantages as well, and we'll see that as the campaign unfolds. Um, they do have lots of techs. I love this from a strategic standpoint because you get lots of choices in the kinds of units you want to specialize in, and it gives you lots of adaptability to different situations that can happen in the game. So. I really enjoy that quite a lot. Some of the other races, um, I've only played the Greenskins, um, so mostly talking about them here, um, but I have almost no tech. So it's very linear, it's very one-sided. Greenskins are fantastic and fun to play, I'll preface by saying that, but tech is not their thing, so it's refreshing to play the Dwarves and um, have some very interesting tech choices. Um, they do have a fairly strong economy. All of their units are very expensive though, so this kind of balances it out. And they have strong leadership and strong artillery. So basically with the dwarves, from what I've discovered so far, is you want to have really strong infantry, a strong front line, and you want to hold the line and just pound them with your ranged units. So you don't have magic, you don't have flanking because the dwarves are super slow and they have no cavalry. Um, so you just want to stand your ground and fight as much as possible. That doesn't mean they're not fun though. They have lots of AoE and explosives. So um, like the satchel charge miners are amazing. Um, and they've got these flamethrower guys as well, uh, the iron drakes. And 
haven't used them yet in the other campaign, but I can just imagine lots of uh, fun situations uh, in which you could use them. So they're by no means a boring race, even though they can't do some of the more exciting tactics like magic and flanking. They have their own uh, levels of excitement. So that's the kind of game we want to play. We want to play ground and pound, hold them in place, blow them up. Um, I think it's a pretty fun play style. So, all right, so we're picking the dwarfs. Uh... It says initial challenge is easy. Um, don't let that fool you. Uh, it's about the same as any other race. Like you start in a fairly secure position in the mountains, but that also means it's much more difficult for you to expand early. And on legendary, it's crucial that you expand as much as you can, as fast as you can. So it's easy in the sense that other enemies can't attack you early on as easily, but it can also be more challenging in the sense that it's harder for you to attack other people. So on Legendary, um, this initial challenge easy here is not quite as um, amateur as it might sound. It's It still uh, presents its own sort of challenges to you. For example, the green stins start off with a normal challenge, for example, so more enemies can hit you, but you can also hit more enemies a whole lot easier. It's just a lot more accessible to get to their towns. So I think it's a um, it's a strategic trade-off. So like I said, we're going to be running this on Legendary. Um, you have your choice between two different Legendary Lords. You have uh, Thorgrim Br Grudgebringer. Um, construction costs minus 10% for military buildings. This is quite a significant bonus. This will save you a lot of money. It will let you tech up faster, especially early, um, early in the game. And... Yeah, it's a good bonus. And minus 10% for long beards and hammers. These are going to be your go-to mid and end-game units. So this is a massive bonus because your upkeep is going to get up into probably the tens of thousands by the time you get to the late game. So you know we're talking over a thousand gold turn just off of this one racial talent. So that's amazing. We also have uh, Ungrim Iron Fist here. And he really focuses on a specific unit in the dwarves called the Slayers. You have minus 50% upkeep costs and minus 25% um, for the initial purchase of Slayers. And that's those are really strong numbers. The only problem with that is Slayers are a very niche unit. They're good at killing monsters and they're terrible at basically everything else. So they can't play the kind of game that the dwarves want to play that I explained, where you hold the line um, in time for your artillery and your range units to blow up the army. Um, so they can't really play that kind of game. They're kind of like your special ops that just run in and kill the giant, kill the trolls. You might have one or two of them in your army late game, um, but you're really not going to be lever leveraging um, these advantages that much. So, And they're both very capable fighters, both of these champions. So you're really just picking them for the bonuses. Um, so I'm going to go with uh, Thorgrim here. I will say that aesthetically and thematically, I don't like him as much. He has people carry him around on this chair, and he just seems very, um, very arrogant. So uh, that might offend you if you're a, you know, a huge Total War lore fan. I don't know a ton about the lore. Um, I mean, he's a good character. I just don't like that he's carried around all these people who look like glorified slaves, as you can see in the picture here. Um, and this guy's just much cooler. I mean, he's got this awesome mohawk and this huge beard. Uh, he just looks great. And we will pick him up through the campaign. Um, but we're going to go with Thorgrim, because this is all about strategy, about playing the best game possible, and he just offers the best stats. So let's go ahead and get into it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and skip the cutscene just for saving a little bit of time here. Um, you, you, of course, can watch the cutscenes. You play your own Dwarven campaigns, but... I'll spend enough time kind of uh, talking about some introductory my stuff. High King. Faced with your terrible wrath, the Greenskins rout, as is typical of their craven nature. The bloody spears still infest the mountains to the east, setting up their hovels amidst your sacred pillars. Another grudge that must be put right, and soon for the lords of the other dwarf holds will not tolerate a high king that cannot secure his own realms. Okay. So I'll, I'll listen to the advisor. Yet more vicious Urki and Groby lay ready to strike at your kin. Seek allies amongst your own folk, for there are many grudges to settle here. Okay, so for some of these smaller cutscenes and when the advisor talks... shall be enthralled to the Karaz Ankor once more. 
and no creature, green skin or otherwise, shall stand in your way. All right, dude. Okay, we got it. There we go. All right, so I'll let him talk some for some of these uh, cutscenes, um, just so you guys can kind of can kind of see what's going on. But I'll just skip that initial one that you've probably seen from the trailers, anyways. Um, okay, so this is a grudge. I'll show you the book of grudges in a second. But basically, these are little missions that you get um, throughout the campaign. If you complete it, you get a uh, a thousand gold. Um, so you just basically have to defeat an army, and they set you up right here on turn one to go defeat an army. So, Book of Grudges here. Basically, anytime anyone tries to wrong you, it goes in the Book of Grudges. So if they step on your land and trespass, if they try to raid your land, if they declare war on you, if they try to assassinate you, um, you get these tabs in the Book of Grudges, and you want to pay them back. So they try to assassinate you, often you will have to go you know, try to assassinate them, and you get paid money for doing that. So it's basically an extreme version of kind of the, the eye for an eye philosophy. So something naturally that you would probably do in a video game anyways. Hopefully not in life, you know. Hopefully you guys are a little bit more uh, forgiving for some people that wrong you out there. Uh, but in this game, you definitely want to get payback as much as possible. And they just basically reward you for something that you would probably be doing anyways. So it doesn't add a lot of strategy um, to the game, but it does make it interesting and it's just really cool from kind of a war perspective too if you go through and read um some of these i'm not going to read them for you but um it, it's pretty interesting from sort of a, a flavorful perspective okay so this does affect strategy though how many you accumulate here so if you get too many grudge this bar will slowly go from left to right and you get um, bonuses or penalties depending on that now they're not huge and game breaking on their own so right now i'm in the green because i don't have that many grudges and so i get one public order and five diplomacy with the dwarfs uh, but as it goes down you start losing a little bit more um, so the spread between positive plus one and the worst negative negative two on the public order can be pretty significant um, once you reach kind of that mid game where chaos is breaking out causing lots of public order problems so uh, you want to get as much public order as possible so always try to keep your grudge book in the green so we'll just start off just looking at the public order here real quick if uh, you're new to total war or if you uh, have uh, not played this total war yet so this is your public order. Some of the other factions might call it other things. I think the uh, Greenskins calls it obedience. Um, but it's basically uh, a, a metric of measuring how um, orderly each specific town is that you have. Um, so the difficulty level on Legendary, you're going to get negative 8. Taxes, always going to give you negative 4. And there's various modifiers that can give you positive. If you get Vampiric Corruption or Chaos Corruption, it'll go down even more. Um, if there's rating in your land, it goes down. So there's lots of modifiers. If you ever reach negative 100, you'll get a rebellion in your province, um, and it gets pretty strong pretty fast. So you just have to kill an army, basically, and it'll drop it back down a little bit. Um, I don't think there's any perk for going into positive public order in this game. I know that in Total War Attila that I played, um, you would actually get bonuses for going in the positive. You would get extra growth and you would get extra money. I've never actually been in the positive um, on Warhammer. It's really hard to do. Um, so I, And the description doesn't say that there's any kind of um, extra penalty or extra positive um, influence to it. So as far as I know, um, just be aware that if you get to 100, you're going to have to defeat a rebel army. Otherwise, it's relatively inconsequential. If I'm wrong about that, just you know, leave a comment and I'll be happy to talk about it in the next episode. But from what I can understand, the only number that matters is negative 100. Okay, so let's talk about a couple other basics here um, and then we'll get to fighting these guys. I just want to introduce you guys to the combat system and how this works. And that might sound really simple, but it's actually a lot more complicated um, than people think. And the reason for this is there's just not a lot of information in the tabs. Um, so if we click on this, this is the unit card. So it'll tell you all sorts of information about the unit. But it doesn't tell you what these things do, statistically. So it says this determines the chance of unit being hit whilst in melee. Um, but it doesn't tell you what that means. What does that mean? Strategy-wise, is that a good number? Is that a bad number? It doesn't tell you anywhere in the tooltips. It doesn't tell you in the encyclopedia, if you look at that. No one ever tells you exactly what this means. So I had to go out, do a little bit of research on my own as I was playing Total War Attila. And you know, I beat that, by the way, on uh, legendary Western Roman uh, Empire. So I've got some experience with uh, Total War. 
but and I'm pretty sure the mechanics are the same in this game but they never explain that so I just want to break it down real quick for you just so you guys know what you're getting into you know what these stats actually mean because even if you've been playing Total War for a while you may not exactly know what some of these stats mean so since I'm on melee defense and attack let's go ahead and talk about that um, so each unit has a 40% base chance to hit another unit in melee combat so that means if both stats are the same if your melee attack and your melee defense of the defender are exactly the same you're gonna have a 40% chance to hit however if one stat is larger than the other the difference will affect your percentage chance to hit either positively or negatively depending on whether the defense is higher or whether the attack is higher so um, and this is a, uh, a one to one percentage basis so let's say that this guy uh, was attacking himself okay so we've got 22 attack and 14 melee defense the defense is higher so you have 14 higher defense so that means there's going to be a 14 percent less chance to hit this guy so you take your base chance of 40 you take off 14 and you end up with a 26 percent chance to hit so if he was trying to hit himself he would only have a 26 chance to hit um, let's see so if this guy was trying to hit him he's got a 22 percent chance or he's got a, a 22 melee attack uh, he's got a Oh, I was looking at him anyways. I thought I was looking at Thorgrim because the picture was there. Anyways, you guys get the picture. Um, if it was the other way around, let's say that... Attack. Let's say that I was trying to attack this guy here. So we have 22 attack, and he has 16 melee defense. So now I have 16 more attack than he has defense. That means I would get... Uh, or 6 more attack, not 16. Um, that means that he's going to have 6% higher chance to hit this guy. So he's going to have 40 plus 6, 46% chance to hit. So that caps at 85% chance to hit. You can't have any more than 85% chance to hit a unit. And the very minimum is a 15% chance. You can't have it reduced below a 15% chance to hit. So that's just very important to keep in mind in terms of melee attack and defense. This does not affect range weapons at all, either in terms of defense or offense. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, Another ability that's even more difficult to understand um, without having researched it is armor. So armor helps stop both melee attacks and ranged attacks. Anything that's going to do physical damage, armor helps stop it. And how armor works is it rolls um, just an imaginary dice of a number 1 to whatever the armor value is. So let's say it's 80 in this example. So you're going to prevent anywhere from 1 to 80 damage statistically um, so break out my uh, calculator here and I can give you guys some exact numbers because um, this is going to get into stats and we won't do stats with every battle I just want to give you guys some examples just to kind of know what you're working with when you read these unit cards just so you can have an idea hey that thing has a lot of armor so I'm probably not going to do a lot of base damage to it so let's just take a look here okay so 80 armor let's say that this guy um, is attacking himself. We'll use just your baseline uh, dwarf warrior here. Let's say he's attacking himself. So he deals weapon strength, 23 base weapon strength. That means that for any roll, uh, 23 to 80, it's going to do absolutely zero damage to the armor person. So that's really important to keep in mind. If that 1 to 80 dice rolls anything between 23 and 80, all of the damage is blocked. It's going to do zero damage. Now, you take half, so anything that's below 23, you're actually going to um, deal uh, some damage. So that's 22 down to 1. So uh, you take half of that, and that is going to be your average damage that you're going to deal because it's going to block um, you know, all the way down from 22 to 1. So half of that is 11. So that means that this is if you actually get through the armor if you don't get a roll of 23 to 80 then you're gonna hit 11 times or you're gonna deal for uh, 11 damage so what you do is you take the 11 um, and you add it to that base block which was 23 or uh, rather 80 um, 23 to 80 which would be 57 different numbers 
you add on, so 57 different rolls will do zero damage, and then you add on that 11 that's going to deal, um, you know, reduced damage. So you take 23, 80, that is 57, plus 11, it's going to give you 68, and then you divide that by the armor value of 80. So 68 divided by 80 is 85. So that means that you're going to have 85% of your damage blocked. So 85 times the base damage here of 23 equals 19.55. Uh, so the difference is about three and a half damage. So all of that math out of the way, basically that means that on an average swing, you're going to deal three and a half damage to somebody because of this armor. So armor is huge. Um, for damage mitigation. On the other hand, there's another component of damage called armor piercing damage that you see right here. That damage goes straight through no matter how much armor they have. So even if they have, you know, a thousand armor, it's still going to deal five damage. So you take that 3.5 mitigated weapon damage that we talked about, you add that to the five armor piercing damage, and you get 8.5 damage. So that's really how much damage you're dealing on a swing. So that's really important to understand mathematically. Now if you look over at these guys, uh, the miners, look at their damage. 17 of it is armor piercing damage. That means 17 of this damage is going straight to their health. Now the other, uh, you know, 5 is going to get mitigated by the armor of 80. So it's going to be um, whatever, 80, 85% off again right so you know it's going to deal like two damage or something so th these guys actually deal way way more damage um, to a heavily armored unit than dwarf warriors the only problem is they're a lot less likely to hit them because they only have 18 melee attack instead of the 22 melee attack um, so that's just important to keep in mind okay so Let's move on. So if it has this little uh, hammer here, that means it deals a lot of armor penetrating damage, and that's going to be really strong. Okay, I think that's it. Is leadership is also really important. If you ever get low leadership, um, then your units are much more likely to to run away in the middle of the fight. Dwarfs have really high leadership, so this is usually not a problem for them. Um, but other factions, such as the Greenskins, have really low leadership. So if we look at this guy. Um, Let's click on this guy. Oh, he actually has pretty high. The goblins are lower, though. See, they've got 40, so they have about 50% less leadership, so they're a lot more likely to run away. Retake the um, charge bonus, not that relevant for dwarves. Like I said, we're not going to be doing a lot of flanking. We're not going to be doing a lot of charging. It's usually pretty low. Um, but basically, if something has a charge bonus and you charge in, you're going to get whatever that number is added to your melee attack rating and added to your um, weapon damage. So that means you would get nine more melee attack and nine weapon damage. So that's pretty huge for things like cavalry. That means you're basically gonna be hitting all the time and you're gonna be doing a lot more damage. And I think that bonus lasts for 10 seconds, I believe, after the charge itself. So things with charge deal a whole lot of damage um, over those 10 seconds and then it falls off. That's why a lot of cavalry won't have as much base melee attack um, and damage as other units because they get that huge bonus um, on the charge. So that's something to keep in mind. Not as relevant for dwarves, but relevant for other things. So what can you take away from all that? The basic thing is you want to be very careful how you engage heavily armored units. Um, you want to have make sure that you have armor piercing damage or just be prepared to have a really long fight. So dwarfs are really good at locking up the line. Like I said before, they have 80 armor, they have really high melee defense, but in exchange they don't really deal that much damage back. So they're going to be sitting there fighting for quite a long time. Um, this shield is also useful. It actually tells you what it does, so it's not that hard to figure out, right? Finally, it t uh, a tooltip is useful here, right? So um, it blocks 30% of all small arms damage. So that means if you shoot a bow at them, 30% chance it's not going to do any damage. So that block doesn't include armor so it has 30 percent base chance to negate everything and then you get the armor value in there that has an even higher chance to negate a lot of things um so it's important to keep in mind all right so 
Yeah, and they have charge defense against large. So if you're just standing there as a dwarf that has this charge defense, then they're not going to get that charge bonus um, if they charge into your front. So that's important to keep in mind. Okay, so let's go ahead and break up some of this talking, and then we'll get into uh, talking about technologies, buildings, and overall strategy. But let's go ahead and get a fight in. So we've got uh, seven units here, and they have six units. Now keep in mind on legendary... Uh, these guys are going to get some extra stats when you're actually in battle. They're going to get a little bit of leadership, um, and they get some other uh, stats as well. I'll have to do some research to see exactly what those are. You can't click on these units when they're in battle um, on legendary mode. Now, I know that I, I could do it in a custom battle, and I, I will, and I'll, I'll put that in the next video. But I know that in Attila, they got a little bit of attack, a little bit of defense, a little bit of damage, just a little sprinkle of everything in there to just make them more combat effective. So pretty much, if you were to try to fight the same unit, if we were um, going dwarf on dwarf here, and I just sent in one bunch of dwarf warriors into a, a legendary computer's unit of dwarf warriors, their unit should win pretty handily. So that means that you really have to use a lot of strategy and tactics um, in the fights. Uh, to actually win them on legendary, particularly if you don't have superior numbers. So, even though I have one more unit, this could be a lot closer than it seems. So, let's go ahead and get into a fight here. Okay, so this is the power meter. Um, this actually shows you uh, what basically what the computer thinks of as your percentage to win the fight. Um, I would say that you almost always want to fight the fight unless you um, have at least a 75% chance to win. So unless the yellow bar is about right here, I would go ahead and fight it. Unless it's fairly close and you look at it strategically and they have key units that are going to be countering your units and the computer is discounting how strong they are against you. So unless you think there's some kind of miscalculation um, in this battle meter and that can happen with specific units. I'll point that out if it does uh, down the line. Um, you probably want to fight it if it's anywhere close to the middle. This little stripe just means the computer is confused. It's not really sure um, about this area. So it could be 50%, it could be 60%. It's not really sure. Um, so this would be the auto resolve if I wanted to auto fight it. If you get into a bad fight, and you don't want to do it. So they had a hidden unit there. I figured out it's Orc Biggins. But if, for example, it was like a giant or something and I didn't see it and I just knew it was going to crush what I had, um, then you could always, uh, not always, but often, you can retreat out of the fight. We're going to go ahead and fight it, so <clears throat> we'll get into this here. So like I said, the strategy of dwarfs is um, hold the line. Pound them with um, pound them with artillery and your ranged units. So, kind of looking at the lay of the land here. Um, often, especially if they have a lot of cavalry, you will want to leverage uh, forests. Because um, if you look over the tooltip here, um, it says large units. Um, it reduces their combat effectiveness. So if they have large units like trolls, uh, wolves, things like that, I'm not exactly sure statistically how that affects large units, uh, but I know they don't fight as well in the woods. So if you can take it to the woods if they have large units, um, that can be very helpful if you have infantry and they have something like horses. Um, you can also hide in the woods. So if I deploy my units into the woods um, and they have the ability to hide, which will have this little um, eyeball here, then you can actually deploy them in the woods and the enemy won't be able to see them until they get close. So that's useful for a lot of other races um, where you want to sneak up on people. If you have vanguard deployment, which lets you deploy uh, in this white zone instead of the yellow zone. So you could deploy in some woods and hide and sneak around and flank them and stuff like that. I do that a lot in the Greenskins um, campaign, but with the dwarves, it's not happening. So let's go ahead and we, I want max range here as much as I can. So this yellow bar out here is the range of the artillery so you can just kind of see how far you're going to be able to shoot and the reason I want max range is I just want to get as many shots in as possible um, before they get too close um, this might be a decent spot over here I also 
well, they're catapults, so it's not as big of a deal if they have to shoot over things. If you have something that's more of a, a line of fire, like a cannon or uh, the hell cannons that you get later that need like a direct like line to fire into, um, then you'll want to put them particularly on top of hills so that you can shoot down on things. So if you put it like right in front of you like this and the terrain is blocking you, um, then you would shoot into the terrain and not hit your target. But because it's catapults, it's going to fling the rocks over the edge. So I don't think it's a big deal if they're back a little bit. And this will give me max range. Alright, so these hammerers are very strong and they have a lot of uh, armor penetration. So they're kind of my elite unit that I get to start off with. Um, dwarf warriors are pretty good. Uh, the picks are pretty good. They're not nearly as good against um, archers. But they are uh, fantastic against heroes and heavily armored units. It's like I discussed a little bit ago. They have um, very heavy... Uh, penetration, although their melee attack and defense are pretty low. So, um, and then the quarrelers will line up up front here. They have pretty good attack range, as you can see, and they deal quite a lot of range damage. All right, so let's go ahead. What do I want to hit? What's the biggest threat here? That has the least amount of armor. See, I can't really see their stats on legendary. Um, and then once the battle starts, it takes off this radar too, so then you can't see the radar. So you can't see the stats, you can't see the radar, and you can't see the balance of power. So you can't really see if you're winning the fight or losing the fight. So um, these are just more modifiers that Legendary attacks on, if you've never played on that before. Um, so the biggins are the biggest threat. They have a little bit more armor than these guys, um, but they also deal a lot more damage. So I think I want to try to pick off the biggins as much as I can. So we're going to go ahead and start. Commence to firing. A lot of times if you're firing artillery, I would try to fire at the uh, front unit. That way, because they're moving forward, if your people miscalculate, they won't overshoot. Um, so they will be much, see that just overshot there. They will be much more likely to hit units if you fire at the front. But because these are um, arrow boys, I'm not really that scared of them. My quarrelers are going to eat them alive because I've got um, shields and really heavy armor. So not worried about that. So I'm aiming for the boys here. See, they're actually pausing a little bit to reform their line because I've hit them. So that's slowing them down even more. Okay, so I want to shoot at these arrow boys for now. Because you're not going to deal damage to their hero with your, uh, with your archers, probably. So we're just going to go ahead and shoot like that. As soon as they get close enough, I'm going to run my, um, my guys past them and pick up the melee. So we're just kind of waiting here, shooting, Let's see if we can get a round in on these orc boys. Right. He's getting kind of close, so we're going to go ahead and start coming out. Okay, then we're going to change targets here. Um, we're going to shoot these guys until they break. And then we're going to change the catapult so I don't shoot my own guys and start shooting these guys until they break again. I'm going to run Thorgrim into these orc boys. Uh, actually, I'm going to run them into these biggins because they're trying to move around and flank right now to hit my archers. So I'm just going to just tie them up for a little bit. And because there's only one of my units right here, um, actually, I'm going to move my archers over here. And then I'm going to fire into their back with my crossbowmen. So we already routed these guys, so let's go ahead and change and start shooting them. So, we're just going to go ahead and shoot into these guys. Just so my units are fleeing, this is not good. Let's see here. Those are just the miners, though. I mean, they're the cheapest unit. There's a lot of cannon fodder there. Um, so, as you can see, we're really tearing these guys up. Um, I would like to go ahead and get a flank over here. What are these guys doing? So, I guess we don't have a clean shot here. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and charge into their back. I'm repositioning here on my slow dwarf legs to shoot these guys in the back. You shoot them in the back, they're much less likely to block. In fact, they're not going to block with their shield at all. Um, well, now Thorgrim's blocking me, so I'm just going to shoot at these guys. Uh... So these guys are reforming, so we're going to go ahead and shoot them. Um, okay, so they're running. 
my hammers are about to about to run. They're getting pretty beat up here. Once again, just reposition and get some shots in there. Um, it's coming at them from the back here. Shooting. Okay, we've got these orc boys coming back in here, so we got to be careful. Um, okay, so they're running away, so I'm going to shoot these orc boys here. Shoot these guys. Let's get in there. Wow, they are really, like, they have some serious morale. Holy crap, they're fighting to the last guy. This is what I'm talking about when I say that the uh, AI gets crazy um, benefits to their uh, AI. Okay. Okay, so we won that fight. Or crazy benefits, rather, to their stats is what I meant to say. If you were a player, there is no way you're running back in with four orc units. They will break and run off the screen at, like, half. Um, so they get huge leadership bonuses as the AI. I really want to run this guy down and kill him. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen. So I suppose I probably should have put my artillery a little bit better on the hill because it's clearly not shooting. Like I thought it would be able to shoot over, um, but they're just really having a hard time with this positioning. So you see the, the dwarves are just so slow. Like, it's just so hard to run people down. Um, and I honestly, I'm probably not going to be able to catch him. But I'm just going to see. I'm going to give it a, a little bit here. Just, I'll speed it up. You can speed up up here. It doesn't look like they're going to get him. I want to fire as many artillery shots as I can, though. Are they... Okay, so we're getting a couple more shots in here. And the reason for this is I just, I'm going to have to fight these guys again, most likely. Um, and I just want to make them as weak as possible. Oh, we got him. So we did actually, they did actually run him down over here. I didn't think they were going to be able to get him, but they did. So he's wounded. Um, so that means we won't have to fight him again. I guess he's the faction leader, so it didn't outright kill him. But good. Okay. So close victory. I would definitely have liked to have won that more decisively. Um, you know, I, I probably could have had Thorgrim match up and go one to one with their guy if I wanted to. But the thing is, Thorgrim's not really that hurt, um, and he's the guy that you want to be in good shape for a re-engagement. So they cleaned them up pretty pretty well, even with their crazy stats. Um, so at the end, you get a little bit of cash, you gain a rank, and uh, you get a decision here. So each different faction has different decisions that you can do um, with the captives. Like the greenskins, you have a third option. You can actually eat them and regenerate faster, or you can slaughter them all and get leadership, like this, um, or you can sell them for, for money, and I don't think you get any kind of penalty for doing that. With the dwarfs, though, if you release them, you get money, but you also lose a little bit of casualty replenishment. So if you're in your own territory, you get to heal some of your units a little bit every turn. If you're in a town, it heals much more. Um, so you're giving up a little bit of that healing, but I'm going to tell you right now, I release every single captive that I can, and the reason for that is money. You need so much money in this game, especially on Legendary, that you really have to squeeze every penny out of everything. So I'm willing to take a hit on replenishment um, as long as I get more money and it can actually hurt you a little bit diplomatically as well if you release captives So for instance other dwarves might not like me as much if I release a lot of orc captives But honestly the diplomatic penalty is not really that significant um, and the gold just far outweighs everything else so I'm gonna go ahead and release um, So because I beat him in battle I get this extra thousand gold, which is really nice because I filled off one of those grudges. It also wiped the grudge off my sheet here, as you can see. So that was a good win. The Grubi maintained but the one job of is not finished. Beneath the pillars of Grungni. So they're giving me another grudge here. Remain in the Damascron any longer. The pillars must be returned to Dwarfen hands. Okay. All right, so we got another grudge. It's basically take this place out. Now, if you look at their building, so basically, if you click on a building in a province, you're going to see all three possible cities. I own this one. Uh, they own this one, which is where he just retreated to. And then uh, they also own this one. If you get all three, 
you'll get a, um, a commandment that you can do, which gives you choices of growth, extra discounts on units, um, lots of really sweet options. So you always want to try to complete a province um, if it's at all feasible. So we want to get this province ASAP so that we can save money on buildings. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the skills really quick, and then I think we can get into another fight. Um, I'll think about it. I'm thinking about another fight. We have seven, but the problem is he has three that are pretty hurt. Um, but then you can also click on this garrison tab, and you can see how many units they have garrison. So they also have... Um, five units garrison so if I go and attack him then it's going to require uh, me beating those three units here that are pretty hurt with these additional uh, five units that they have so they'll have eight units three of which are hurt I have seven units um, but my front line is pretty banged up here as you can see I can use him as a front line probably because he's pretty healthy and beat them up because they don't have a lord so I'll probably end up fighting them I'll save that for uh, near the end of the episode here. So, we've got about 10 more minutes or so, and I'm going to end the episode. So, let's go ahead and um, look at the skills really quick. We'll do that fight, and then we'll end the episode and go to the next, uh, go to the next episode. So, you look at this tab here, and you've got all kinds of extra customization options, which is really cool. I think this is a great upgrade from Attila. So you can get all sorts of armors to choose from, weapons, talismans, little... And all of these things give you... Um, some of them are combat bonuses, and some of them are just campaign bonuses, like extra cash, extra public order, things like that. So it's really cool. Um, <clears throat> and you can acquire traits as well. So as you win more fights, as you take more political actions, you'll get various traits. Most of them are good. There's a couple of bad ones, but most of them are good, which is a great improvement from Attila. I mean, I think that Attila was, was cool and historically accurate that sometimes you would get negative traits for things. Um, but I like the balancing of the game around... Uh, positive traits so just making it where if you manage to survive long enough to come become a really high level general um, that you just get all these really cool perks and traits to go along with it and that you're not just derailed you know if you have like a, a 22 level 22 legendary lord and all of a sudden you just get this horrible trait that just like is going to completely nullify all that hard work you've been doing the whole time so I like that they're moving towards positive traits, so that's how this is going. Um, you can see all of his stats here. You can see all of his modifiers here. Um, so if if you you know if I get certain banners or um, abilities as the game goes on, they'll show up here. And then it also lists all of your battle effects and all of your campaign effects that you've accrued. So we leveled up. So that means we get one point in the skill tree. We'll look at this really quick. Um, these things that are chained are special um, gear that he can get but you have to reach a certain level and you have to do a chain of quests to be able to get this gear. And this is usually best in slot gear um, for whichever legendary lord you choose. And everybody gets these little quests and legendary gear, so that's pretty cool. And then you have kind of these personalized, um, unique skills up here that he can get. You know, like minus missile damage, high king if he dies or is about to die, all of your troops get extra bonuses. Um, <clears throat> and then extra leadership, so I don't particularly like any of these. Um, this one I might get later on when we start facing more upgraded um, firepower, especially armor-piercing power. This is very useful because the resistance actually reduces even armor-piercing uh, damage that you take, which armor can't do that, so that will be useful down the line. So I'm just going to talk real quick about my strategy with the skills, then we'll do that fight, and then we'll move to the next episode. I know there's a lot of exposition in this episode. Um, it's going to be a little bit more swift in future episodes, but I just want to catch everyone up to speed. If you're new to the game, or even if you've been playing for a while and didn't realize some of these things, um, I just want to fill you in and just help you become the best player that you possibly can. So I'm just trying to walk you through some of the stats and then some of the decisions um, that I make based on these stats and how they play out in the strategy of the game. So... First off, your first point on any character, any race, anytime, anywhere is always going to be Root Marcher. The reason for that is the 10% movement range is invaluable. There's just so many times in this game where it's just a matter of pixels on your computer between whether you can attack the person or you have to wait another turn, or whether you can run away or they catch you, or whether you're going to be able to replenish this turn in your town and fight the battle the next turn with your guys healed up, or whether you're not going to be able to do that and have to fight a losing battle. So 
10% campaign movement speed is phenomenal. So you absolutely have to take that at all times. Um, the rest of the stuff in this tree, I don't really like that much on most heroes. The reason is this is a lot of uh, campaign themed uh, skills. So you get uh, extra chance to intercept people burrowing. You get uh, siege holdout time. You get corruption reduction you get a little bit of extra cash for building buildings so this is all very useful and helpful but the thing is with your general that's going to be in battle doing the fighting you need them to actually be able to fight well you need to win fights you're going to be able to pick up extra characters down the line that'll give you these bonuses um so we'll pick up some thanes we'll pick up some runesmiths we'll pick up some extra characters that aren't as pivotal to the fight that we can actually put out on the field in strategic locations to get these bonuses so i like picking this stuff up with um, other champions down the line that aren't as pivotal to your success on the battlefield um, this up at the top is going to be sort of your personalized duelist power it empowers your um, your champion to have the best stats um, that he possibly can so um, you get extra armor you get extra leadership extra melee defense which is really good I mean if you just look at this statistically um, you've got nine melee defense I start off with a base of 60 um, so that's what an extra sixth or so um, so you know you're looking at an extra 15% or so effectiveness um, reduction basically in the damage he's gonna take in melee combat um, because they're going to hit him 15% less of the time if he has this kind of melee defense. So that's really useful. And then this gives you 30% more hit points. That's also very useful. Um, so these are all good stat boosters. However, however, I will put almost all of my points exclusively in the middle tree, and I'm going to explain why. So the reason is these are all army buffers. This buffs large sections of your entire army. So... An easy way to think about this is you can either buff one person or you can buff 19 other people if you have a 20 stack army. And I think it doesn't really take long before you figure out that the math favors buffing the 19 people over the one person. So yeah, it's really cool if you can run up in battle and you know 1v1 the other legendary lord. Um, but meanwhile, they may have specced into um, these sort of buffs for their entire army. And even if you win that 1v1 battle, they're just going to stomp the rest of your army. So always go for the middle. I tend to do this with the green skins as well. You always want the buffs on everybody because it just has a much larger statistical impact on the battle. Um, so let's look at some of these buffs that you can get real quick and then we'll do the fight and end the episode. So leadership, not a huge deal. You just have to get it early on. The dwarves already have phenomenal leadership, 85. Um, so they're not going to be running away from a lot of things. Lord of the Deeps, once again, leadership, this time only in a subterranean battle, which there will be some of those, but even if it was just flat leadership and not not in the tunnels, I probably still wouldn't get it. There's just better stuff. This is absolutely insane. Axe Lord might be the best um, skills that you can get. It's the best, certainly, that I've seen out of the dwarves and the greenskins. This is borderline overpowered, and I'm going to explain why. So if you get to the third tier here, which you can do as... Um, what I'm level two now and I got one point so three four five six you can get this by level six look at these stats 12 melee attack 12 defense for dwarf warriors let me take a look at these dwarf warriors real quick here for you we'll look at them again okay so their baseline is 22 melee attack so they get a bonus of 12 melee attack to that base that is over 50% more melee attack that means you're gonna be hitting 50% more and that means you're going to be dealing 50% more damage. So the backbone of your entire army is dealing 50% more damage off of that. That is ridiculous. That is so strong. It's just insane. And now let's look at his defense. 36. So not only are you going to be doing 50% more damage, you're getting 12 more defense. That's a third more defense. So they're going to be hitting you a third less of the time. So you're basically getting 50% more damage and... 33% damage mitigation in melee combat. Just think about that. How effective that is. That Your troops are almost 100% more combat effective off of that. They're 83% more combat effective after that. That is On level 6, 
level 6. That is ridiculous. That is so strong. And let me tell you, it's not just early in the game. You're going to be using Dwarf Warriors a lot in the game. Because, yeah, we're going to tech up, and we'll talk about this next episode. We're going to be teching up, you know, learning all kinds of cool things, picking up gyrocopters. We're going to be picking up some hammers and all this other stuff. But, you know, the truth of the matter is, you're not going to have those everywhere. This is a huge map. If we look at this map here, and we'll talk about this more next time too, but we've got a huge map here, right? So you're not going to be able to build all of these high-tech units in every single town. You're going to have a few key strategic locations, perhaps, um, scattered throughout the Empire where you can recruit these really high-tier units. Everywhere else, you're just going to have these little low-tier units just to fill out your army. Because if you're on the fringe of your empire, you know, trying to take over a, a couple of remaining strongholds down here, and they have some armies, and, you know, your forces are getting whittled down, you're just going to drop a level 1 recruitment center over here and just buy a couple of dwarf warriors just to round out your army because they're a good, solid um, unit, especially for the cost. So you're going to be having a lot of dwarf warriors even into the mid, possibly even into the late game, especially on these fringe reason, regions. So this is a very, very relevant um, talent throughout the entire game. So it makes your units very overpowered early game, and it also is very relevant late game. So I just, I've seen other streamers, and they skip this and just go for this up here. And I just like fell out of my seat when I saw that because this is just so ridiculous. It's so strong. You have to get it. Like, there's there's no other option. Three points in this ASAP. It's not even negotiable. This is also ridiculous. It's 24% extra damage, basically. You get 12% melee damage and 12% um, ammunition, which, if you get to fire all of your ammo in a long fight, that's an extra 12% damage. So that's extremely good as well. Um, but we're not really going to be able to leverage that until we get the Thunders later on. So we'll get that. Um, but we'll get to it later on. Obstinacy, really good. Now, to be honest, I don't know the statistics behind this, but I know that buffing Vigor is extremely strong. So um, if your Vigor goes low, that means that um, you're not going to be able to uh, hit as often. You're going to run a lot slower. I think you're a lot less accurate with bows. So there's a lot of factors that play into um, Vigor. But I think just having it reduced by a large amount means that you're going to last a lot longer in these huge melee scrums. You're going to stay fresh. You're going to hit more. You're going to be shooting better. I don't know the exact stats. I just know that it's strong. So you want to get that rally. You just have to get that to get to the next level. Same deal. 12 attack, 12 defense for your later game units. Long beards, hammers, iron breakers. So the statistical increase is not as high as it is for the Dwarf Warriors because the Dwarf Warriors start from such a, a low base of stats. This is still just a phenomenal talent. So absolutely three points in that um, ASAP. Now Thunderer, similar again. Um, lots of extra damage for kind of your later game firing unit. So you want to get that, but kind of near the end of the tree. This is the weakest in the tree. It just affects um, gyrocopters and gyro bombers. Um, I still pick this up, but, you know, you want this to be near the end of the, the last things that you get, right? Um, so for this, you'll just get three in this and then like one in Thunder, I think, to move up to this. This is phenomenal. So it is a huge steroid. So you get 36 extra melee defense, 34 extra attack. Like that is so strong. I mean, if you're just looking at the dwarfs over there, that's over 200% extra combat effectiveness. That's more melee attack than they initially have, and it also um, is double the melee defense that they have. So you are just going to be basically getting invulnerability from melee just about, and you're going to be hitting every single swing that you take for 11 seconds. So, And it affects people in a 40 meter range, so that can hit almost your whole army if you're really lined up in this tight sort of melee formation. Um, so yeah, it has a 90 second cooldown, whatever. It's phenomenal. So. You definitely want to race and get that cooldown as fast as possible. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and... I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead and end the episode here. And then we'll start off the next episode um, with a fight. And then we'll go into um, more choices that we could make in terms of buildings and sort of what my grand strategy will be. But thank you guys very much. I hope you've enjoyed this so far. I hope you've learned a few, um, a few things. And, uh, yeah, keep following me, keep watching, and we'll work through this campaign. Have a great evening.